Homeowners and landlords are seeing their insurance costs skyrocketing. And in some cases, they are losing their insurance altogether, even after years of paying the same company without making any claims. What should homeowners and investors know about this? I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Well Show. You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Well, our guest today is an expert in insurance with lots of years of experience, and he's here today to tell us what we should know. Ron, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Kathy. Insurance has been a hot topic and a frustrating one for so many of us. So let's just start with what is going on. Why have insurance rates gone up so dramatically across the country? Yeah, you, you nailed it. It's been a hot topic. And for real estate investors, it's been it's become a big deal cost factor. And really, there's a bunch of reasons, but there's two big ones. And the first one is there's been an increase in both the frequency and severity of natural disasters. Think hailstorms, wildfires, tornadoes, even this past weekend, all through the middle of the country. I think there were upwards of 80 tornadoes. That type of activity is continuing to increase simultaneously as we all know inflation has been a thing over the last few years so we're seeing more disasters happen and those disasters are more expensive to repair when they do happen and that combination means insurance companies are having to increase their premiums to remain profitable and in some parts of the country they're just pulling out of the market altogether yeah i'm in california and we've absolutely experienced that and i understand i mean there's been wild so many wildfires and they're so expensive However, there seems like it, it crosses over to states where it, they don't have that many issues. So why is that? You know, just because something happens in one part of the country doesn't mean it's not impacting the insurance company's entire balance sheet is, is the first part of the answer. And the second part is really just overall, we have seen more natural disasters all across the country and even those areas that aren't so disaster prone like Florida and California. So it's a combination of both of those things that the insurance companies are scrambling to keep up with. So when an insurance company leaves a state and suddenly people who have been paying in for, for decades into the same company suddenly have nothing, I mean, what do they do? Where do they turn? It's a, that's, that's a tough question because they have to turn to either the insurance companies that are still operating in that state. And California is the big example, right? You're seeing companies just leave left and right. And, and everyone's looking for the next company to insure them. And sometimes there is none. And so in a state like California, what you're seeing is people have to go to the state run market of last resort, which is the fair plan. And so we're seeing more and more people where that's their only option. Same uh, similar thing happening in Florida with their, their state run citizens program. More and more people are getting dropped from their coverage, not able to find replacement coverage and having to fall back on the state run program. Yeah, and the coverage through the state doesn't cover everything. So it, it's going to be really interesting to see if this continues. I mean, do you see it continuing to get worse or is there hope? You know, it's a really tough um, question. I think when you think about all the factors that are causing it to begin with, we're starting to see some promising news on inflation, maybe. And if that continues to level off and flatten out, that pressure will subside a little bit. The X factor continues to be the increase in natural disasters. And that one, we don't really know. I think if we continue to see an increase in activity, especially like we saw last weekend, uh, we're going to see insurance companies having to continue to raise rates more and more and continue to limit their exposure in risky markets. Uh, speaking for the conversations we have in the industry with our carrier partners, the tone is generally more optimistic than it was, you know, the, last year, but um, we're still not out of the woods. <sighs> okay, yeah, I'd heard sort of whisperings that things were going to get better, but you're you're right. I mean, the question many people have is: is there really an increase in these problems in these? Um, events or is it just more people more houses in places they shouldn't be you know in areas that have forest fires yes and yes <laughs> uh, we're, we're looking shows it's all the above it's an increase in the number 
of the weather events that are happening. It's an increase in the cost because of inflation and material and labor costs. And, and to your point, it's an increase in people moving to parts of the country and construction happening in parts of the country that are high risk, like Florida, for example. Yeah, it's interesting. We bought a brand new duplex through our network. We have, um, as you know, we have property teams across the country. Some of those are, are new builds. They're, they're brand new homes. Uh, we bought a brand new duplex not that far from the ocean. It kind of freaked me out, but it's, um, you know, Jacksonville, but just south. Yeah. And our insurance was really low, I guess, because it's a new property. It was built to hurricane standards. Are you seeing certain properties are easier to insure than others? Absolutely. And, you know, Jacksonville is not as risky as like uh, Miami beaches, for example, from the insurance company's perspective. So there are little pockets where you can still find deals that, that make sense from an insurance cost standpoint. Um, so, yeah, definitely a huge variance from one county to the next. Uh, and then depending on the insurance company you look at, we're seeing huge variances in prices from one company to the next as much as 50 percent. So it's important that that you shop, too. Yeah, I mean, knock on wood, our, our St. Pete property is an older one, and that really hasn't gone up that much either. I, I don't know why, but maybe it seems like it would be really high risk. <laughs> yep. Okay, very fascinating. Okay, so how is this going to affect real estate if a, if a lender is going to require that you have insurance and you can't get insurance? What's go How does that work? It's getting... It's getting to become a really hot topic because um, in instances where the lender requires you have coverage, if you don't have coverage, they can, in many instances, by forced place coverage on the property. And even that type of coverage in some parts of Florida is being hard to come by where, you know, the, the person that owns the property doesn't have insurance. The lender tries to obtain the forced place coverage. And they are, in instances, can't even find a company that will write the force place coverage. So we're starting to see now some properties just sit there uh, uninsured, which is risky for everybody. Woo. Okay, which would have me think that lenders would maybe stop lending in those areas. Could be. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Very dramatic and concerning. I wonder, has there been any talk on the federal government level of jumping in somehow and helping? I, I mean, how could they? I don't think they went out. They're broke. <laughs> we haven't heard We haven't heard much at the federal level. It's very much a, a, a state particular issue with some states feeling it much worse than others and those governments each kind of approaching it a little bit differently. Uh, but we haven't heard much at the federal level. And then I don't know if you can speak to this, but multifamily properties have been extremely challenged as well. If you were single family investors here for the most part, um, but multifamily, you have a whole building, you know, that you've got to insure and in many cases can't. And then, you know, you've got a much bigger loan. There's more at stake. So, uh, you know, what are you seeing there in the multifamily market? You know, the issues we're talking about are impacting the insurance market as a whole, the property and casualty insurance market. And so when you think about the subset of that market, that is real estate investor insurance, and then an even smaller subset of that would be multifamily real estate investor insurance. It, it's generally harder and harder to obtain the coverage you need in, in a healthy market. So as the market gets harder and harder, you're going to see more and more difficulty getting insurance for those more niche products. And, and multifamily, that, that's definitely a good example of that. Yeah. Okay. So your company <laughs> offers insurance. What do we need to know about um, working with Steadily? You know, we, uh, we insure rental properties. That's what we exist to do. We're, we're live across the country and we've got probably 25 to 30 different carriers today that we shop from. So it's tough out there. It, it's uh, rates are high, availability is limited. What we can do is shop. And because of that, we're gonna be pretty competitive because some companies are gonna offer coverage where others won't. And that's where we come in to be able to help compare your options and see what's possible. And you are uh, in all 50 states except Florida and New York. We are, we operate in all 50 states. We have our own insurance products that we write in 
48 states where we're not in Florida and New York, but in those states, we do have relationships with carrier partners that we can write coverage through. So what should a landlord know in advance, you know, when getting their policy? It's obviously different than your primary residence. What are the the top three things that investors should be asking for? You know, um, I'd say it depends if there's a lender involved. If there's a loan on the property, the lender is going to have usually a, a list of things that they're going to want on the insurance, mm-hmm. uh, which makes it a little bit more straightforward. If there's no lender involved, it really comes down to your risk tolerance and the, and, and the risk reward that you're willing to take in your portfolio. We see some investors come to us and say, look, I'd be better off buying the baseline actual cash value coverage across my portfolio than I would be buying full replacement cost coverage because I could afford to lose one or two properties a year and a total loss and still come out ahead. And so, you know, an insurance agent's job is to educate you on the options that you have available, make sure you know what you're buying. But at the end of the day, you know, it's up to you to make the right decision for you and your portfolio. So I would think that would make sense if you have, if you're more diversified. I mean, if you owned all your properties on one street, you probably you probably don't want to do that. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So it all depends. I think the, the big things to, to your question are uh, replacement cost coverage versus actual cash value. Generally, investors will want to make sure that if something happens to the property, the insurance company is going to pay the cost to replace it today versus the cost minus the depreciation uh, on that property. Liability is a, is a hot topic for investors. A lot of investors want a million dollars worth of coverage and liability. Um, and then, you know, at that point, there's a lot of different optional coverages that you can choose from, uh, water backup, different levels of personal property, depending on how many things you have in the property and those types of things. Okay. Um, so landlord insurance, what else, how is it different than your regular insurance? I know you, you probably want, um, some coverage if, if you, I don't know, loss of rent or, you know, what, what kinds of options are available for the landlord? Exactly. Loss of rents coverage is a popular one. So if there's a loss that's happened to a covered claim, tornado comes through and rips off the house and because rips off the roof of the house. And because of that, you can't have a tenant in there for three months. It will cover uh, the loss of rent. Um, Generally, it's written such that the company insurance company understands that the exposure is that there's a tenant living in there versus a primary homeowner living in there. And it's very important that they understand that difference, because if it's not written Correctly as a landlord policy and a claim happens, generally it wouldn't be covered because they need to be aware of that up front. Yeah. And, and isn't there a policy for if it's sitting vacant and you just haven't been able to lease it, you, yep. you need to make sure you're covered during the time that it's vacant? Exactly. You'd need to write a vacant policy on that property. So yep. what would you say your company is doing different than other insurance companies? Because you're still around, you're still offering insurance and we appreciate that. You know, um, we're very deliberate in how we price risk when, when it comes to insurance rates, it's important to get that right. Because if you charge too little and you're not fully factoring in the probability and possibility of loss, you're going to become unprofitable and you're not going to be around too long. And obviously if you charge too much, you're going to be uncompetitive and you're not going to grow. So we're really deliberate about striking that right balance to keep our rates competitive. We're not going to be the least expensive option a hundred percent of the time will be competitive, but we're focused on long-term profitability so that we can, we can be here for the long term. Okay. I love it. And uh, for our listeners who want to find out more about you, we have all your contact details in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. Um, any last tips for us landlords who are, or just homeowners who are really concerned about what's happening and whether or not they'll be able to get insured? Yeah, don't don't use the uh, insurance premium that the last person was paying when you're pricing a deal. Do your own shopping. Make sure you check several options because you could see a big price increase that would change the the dynamics of that deal for you. Yeah, so get it priced before you before you close on the deal. That and then definitely shop around. Don't just take the first one or two quotes. Either work with a broker that can shop multiple options or shop several ones yourself but there can be a big difference in price from one company to the next, especially in this market. Oh, great advice. All right, Ron. Well, thank you so much for being here on The Real Wealth Show. Have a wonderful rest of your day. 
Thank you, Kathy. Likewise, thank you for having me. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you'd like to find out more about Ron's company and how they can give you a free quote, you'll see the link in our show notes. I'm Kathy Fetke. Thanks for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show, and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.